buenos días tengan todos ustedes. El Instituto de Física de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México y la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias les dan la más cordial bienvenida a la ceremonia de ingreso de la doctora Aurora Hernández Machado como miembro correspondiente de la Academia. Nos acompañan en el presidium la doctora Cecilia Nogués Garrido, investigadora de este instituto, en representación del doctor Manuel Torres Lambazat, director. El doctor José Luis Morán López, presidente de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. La doctora Aurora Hernández Machado, miembro correspondiente del nuevo ingreso e investigadora de la Facultad de Física de la Universidad de Barcelona. El doctor Rafael Barrios Paredes, investigador del Instituto de Física de la UNAM y anfitrión de la doctora Hernández en México. Damos la bienvenida también a los proponentes del ingreso de la doctora Hernández a la Academia, el doctor Mariano López de Aro, investigador del Instituto de Energías Renovables de la UNAM, y en algún momento a la doctora Julia Tagüeña. Escucharemos a la doctora Cecilia Noves, quien dará unas palabras de bienvenida. Sí, muy buenos días, tengan todos. Eh, bueno, hoy me, me toca dar estas palabras de bienvenida. En, este, en representación del doctor Manuel Torres, director de este instituto. Y bueno, el doctor Barrio me pidió que hablar en inglés y este, me dijeron que bueno, que diera la bienvenida en español, entonces no sé, eh, puedo hacer un híbrido posiblemente. ¿no? Entonces, bueno, yo había escrito algunas palabras. Y bueno, déjenme empezar. Bueno, on behalf of the director of the Physics Institute, doctor Manuel Torres, let me welcome you today. Uh, it is always important to recognize the contribution of, from scientists uh, beyond our frontiers. Uh, but it's more important to build bridges uh, for our community, uh, uh, for our scientific community. I'm sorry, I, I have a thank you, some thing. Only with a sum and a diversity of minds, it is possible to science make uh, significant Uh, uh, progress. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced about that. Therefore, the physics community, uh, our community here in the Physics Institute, welcome Professor Aurora Hernandez Machado. And uh, please consider this uh, your, your second institution, please. Uh, and uh, <coughs> as an important partner for, you, for your collaborations. Finally, I would like to, to transmit the congratulations and uh, the best wishes for our for a successful event and meeting from Dr. Manuel Torres, who is not present here today for different reasons. But uh, thank you very much for the Academia Mexicana de Ciencias, okay, for the realization of this important uh, event. It is always important to have this, uh, uh, to build these uh, bridges uh, with other communities, with other important scientists. And uh, congratulations to Dr. Uh, Aurora Hernández Machado, and uh, welcome you again. Y bueno, pues muchas gracias a, a todos ustedes por estar aquí presentes. Eh, eh, es muy importante realmente eh, eh, tener a la diversidad de mentes para construir en ciencia. La ciencia, las leyes de la física son universales, ¿no? Entonces, es muy, muy importante siempre estar abiertos a otras comunidades y por favor que esto no sea únicamente una, una ceremonia sino que realmente tienda los puentes necesarios entre nuestras diferentes instituciones y otra vez muchas gracias por estar aquí en, en nombre del director del Instituto de Física gracias a continuación eh, el doctor Mariano López de Aro investigador del Instituto de Energías Renovables de la UNAM y proponente de la doctora Hernández, nos presentará la semblanza de la doctora Hernández. I'm sorry for the change of program, but I was asked to deliver this uh, small speech concerning Aurora, whom I met a long, long time ago, longer than many of you would know. Anyway, um, I was told to read what Rafael prepared for Aurora and uh, He starts by saying that she was born in Barcelona, although she preferred to say that she was born in 
La Rioja. Anyway, the land of the wines. And uh, she studied physics in the University of Barcelona, I think. And she obtained her doctorate there uh, under the supervision of Maxi San Miguel in 1985. She uh, carried out the postdoctoral stay at the Philips University in Marburg, Germany from 85 to 86. And she got a Fulbright postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh in the United States in 1987. She has been assistant professor at the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, Universitat de Barcelona. Uh, she has been research consultant at the University of Pittsburgh. And she has been a member of the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the University of California in Santa Barbara in 1992. She also has, uh, stayed uh, uh, on the sabbatical at the Université de Paris in 2001. And another sabbatical stay, believe me or not, here at UNAM in 2008. And she was a, a full <coughs> professor in physics. She's been uh, full professor in physics at the Universitat de Barcelona from 2012. Her scientific career is uh, well known uh, worldwide because she has made a lot of uh, theoretical investigation on uh, the physics of condensed matter, uh, statistical physics out of equilibrium, complex systems, biophysics and microfluidics, and nanosciences. On top of that, she uh, is uh, the head of uh, an experimental group in imbibition, viscoelastic fluids, and blood flows. Uh, that's the topic of her talk today. She's got a patent of a micro rheometer, uh, a European patent, and a United States patent of, on the same uh, uh, device. And this was done with a Mexican student collaboration. Uh, Aurora has got 113 international publications with over uh, 1,500 uh, citations, and a few of her publications have had an important impact. She has published in na Nature Materials, uh, Nature Communications, and Physical Review Letters. She has supervised nine doctorate theses and, and eight master's theses. She has re already uh, got a lot of uh, recognition for her works. Uh, important thing to mention is that the doctoral thesis of uh, Felix Campello, who was he, her student, was uh, uh, honored with the prestigious uh, prize Outstanding Doctoral Thesis Research in Biological Physics in 2010. And this is a, an international competition of the American Physical Society. She has also established a red of uh, collaborations with Spain, United States, Germany, France, Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Hungary, Belgium, Portugal, Mexico, Finland, Israel, and Brazil. And she has been the leader of uh, a lot of projects. She has organized international conferences, and she has given uh, lectures at schools, uh, international workshops, uh, uh, conferences, and many seminars. Her collaborations with uh, the scientific Mexican community is vast. She uh, started as a visiting professor in the winter meeting of statistical physics in 2002. And since she has come many, many times to Mexico, invited to collaborate scientifically, including a sabbatical, uh, a two months stay at UNAM, invited by Eugenia Corbera from Facultad de Química. Uh, she's got a patent with uh, E. Rodriguez Villarreal, three projects in international projects of research with Eugenia Corbera, uh, Rodrigo Ledesma, and Rafael Barrio. She has directed the doctoral thesis of Rodrigo Ledesma, who uh, presently is a professor titular at uh, the, I think it's professor at the University of Northumbria in the United Kingdom. And her lab in the University of Barcelona, she has received Eugenia Corbera many times, and she has invited Rafael Barrio and Eugenia Corbera uh, for uh, uh, short stays over and collaborations over there. She has financed the postdoctoral stay of uh, Dr. Rodriguez Villarreal, and she has supervised and financed uh, research stays for various Mexican students of UNAM. She's got 30 publications in, with, uh, uh, that she has co-authored with Mexican researchers. And uh, amongst the researchers, amongst the students, I will mention Rodrigo, of course, and uh, uh, Felipe, and, uh, ah, of course, the uh, students, the Mexican students include Yvonne Dominguez Román, Hernán Barrio San, Areli González Guevara, and Mireille Rago Gutiérrez, and uh, Joaquín Flores, who was a student of uh, 
Eugenia Corbera and a collaborator of, of mine as well. She has spent, he has spent many times with, with uh, uh, Aurora. So I think uh, it's a real honor for the Mexican Academy of Science to have uh, Aurora as a correspondent member. And uh, I personally congratulate her on that achievement. And I hope that you will enjoy what he, she will have to say later. Thank you very much. El doctor José Luis Morán dará la bienvenida a la doctora Aurora Hernández y hará entrega del diploma de ingreso a la academia. Antes, darle la palabra a al doctor Barrio. Si okay. sí. Perdón. I'm sorry, I'm not in the program, but I just want to say a few words about Aurora, not the professor, not the physicist, not the scientist, but the friend. It, it, For me, it has been a great event in my life to meet Aurora, mainly because she is one of the persons who have qualities that I don't. And amongst them is a superb elegance in everything she does, uh, from science to eating. Uh, she is also The, one of the most organized minds that I know. She's able to deal with 15 different projects full time, all of them simultaneously. So, for me today is a day of great joy because she has become one of us. Thank you very much. Toma la palabra el doctor Morán. Muy buenos días a todos. Eh, en primer lugar, eh, deseo manifestar mi gran gusto por estar en, el, en ese instituto que cumple 80 años eh, y esta es una de las actividades que se desarrollarán a lo largo de, de este año para celebrar tan importante contribución que ha tenido este instituto en la creación de la, de la física en el país. ¿no? Eh, así que me da doblemente gusto, en primer lugar, por este hecho, y el otro, darle la, el ingreso este, a la doctora Aurora Hernández Machado como miembro correspondiente. Eh, quiero agradecer también eh, a Leticia, este, y que por favor nos dé, le dé las gracias a... Señor, perdón, es, es, Cecilia Nogués. Sí. Sorry. Eh, Cecilia Nogués por eh, estar aquí en, en representación del director, Manuel Torres, que este, me imagino que haber tenido algunas otras actividades, que también ha sido eh, un, es, un aliado constante eh, de la academia a lo largo de todos los años. Este, que, de los que yo tengo memoria, eh, y que también el, el, el Instituto de Física ha sido una pieza fundamental para la academia. Así que esta este, relación entre Instituto y Academia de Física creo que son, es un efecto este, que se nota y que se seguirá notando a lo largo de los años. Eh, a Rafael también le agradezco eh, al haber propuesto a tan importante científica española eh, de la cual acabamos de escuchar sus merecimientos y sus eh, logros a lo largo de, de su carrera. Eh, leí la semblanza que me hicieron favor de, de hacerme llegar y notar que en, en realidad es una científica eh, que le gustan los retos y la, eh, los problemas complejos. Eh, pero no solamente le gusta, sino que también lo sabe resolver. Y la relación con, con México ha sido pues también notable, eh, ha formado gente para nuestro país, ha tenido colaboraciones con el Instituto de, de Energías Renovables en, en Cuernavaca, eh, el, también en, en el caso de la Facultad de Química de, de, la, de la UNAM, además de, del Instituto de Física. Eh, estas son las características que deseamos tengan nuestros miembros correspondientes. 
y en el caso de ella, pues este, vemos que es, ha sido una selección realmente muy acertada. Eh, así que bueno, bienvenida a, a, la, a la academia, nada más para dar algunos números, este, el, la academia, eh, el número de miembros eh, con, este, que forman la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias somos 2.779 en todas las áreas. Aquí no, no es Academia de Ciencias y Humanidades, sino solamente Academia de Ciencias, porque sabemos que las humanidades son, son también ciencias. Pero hay representantes de todas las áreas, la economía, la ingeniería, medicina, ingeniería, este, y es un grupo muy dinámico, es un grupo muy escogido. En el Sistema Nacional de Investigadores eh, ahora llega al orden de... 30.000 y más o menos el 10% de ellos son los que son miembros de la academia. Eh, también este, eh, contamos eh, con 109 miembros correspondientes, lo cual este, también es un número importante y en el cual están personas como usted este, y algunos premios Nobel que han tenido relación importante con México y que también han aceptado la distinción por parte de la academia. Eh, termino simplemente diciendo que en estos tiempos difíciles de incertidumbre de un arranque, un arranque de una administración diferente y compleja este, tenemos que eh, seguir siendo aliados como mencioné hace rato este, tenemos que seguir este, luchando porque la, la ciencia se siga desarrollando sabemos que sin educación y sin ciencia un país no tiene un, país, un, un futuro cierto eh, y creo que es nuestra responsabilidad tratar de continuar con estos proyectos eh, que la comunidad científica eh, ha emprendido desde hace décadas y que debemos de seguir eh, consolidando. Hay mucho por hacer este, y bueno, estamos siempre dispuestos y estaremos siempre dispuestos a colaborar con las autoridades en turno, eh, pero creo que este, eh, nuestra obligación es eh, mantener y eh, ofrecer apoyo y mantener los estándares de la ciencia internacional. Así que este, muchísimas gracias a todos por estar aquí y les deseo que tengan un, un día, este, una mañana de trabajo realmente muy exitosa. Muchas gracias. A continuación, el doctor Morán hará entrega del diploma que acredita a la doctora Hernández como miembro correspondiente de la Academia. Les pedimos ponerse de pie, por favor. Pues aquí está tu diploma de ingreso. Uh -huh. Bienvenida. Muchas gracias. Uh -huh. No, Gracias. Bueno. Hasta allá de Hollywood. Muchas <risa> felicidades. Muchas gracias a todos y a continuación escucharemos la plática que la doctora Hernández ofrece por su ingreso a la Academia. minutos antes de acabar. ¿Quieres que te avise cuando haya cierto? Sí. Pero él, no, él, él es un chef más muy relajado, no. deja dos horas. No. no, no, yo te digo, a los 40 te aviso. Vale. vale. Pero, tú, tú, pero tú eres el que mandas. No, no sé. ¿Cómo? ¿Cómo no, que no? Aquí no hay chef. Aquí no hay chef. No, no, o sea, es... Ahora que soy miembro de la academia, a ver si os arregláis un poco en este tema, si sois más organizados.
¿Qué hora es? Va. No más. ¿Eh? ¿Sí? Mira, se ha sentado en la mesa en la silla de Julia. En vez de sentarse ahí. ¿Qué país? ¿Qué país? Estos son ¿Se oye? Sí, se oye. ¿Ya está? Ok. Bueno, bueno, I am very happy. I am very happy when I am in Mexico. Always, I have been many times. And you know that I have many collaborators. I am, I thank really the Academia for this honor. And especially Rafael and Eugenio. And uh, Julia and Mariano and Antonio for helping me to become a member. And I want to talk about physics, okay? I want to, do, to talk about uh, my present interest in physics and my future interest. I feel very happy when I do physics and I like very much to do physics in different aspects. I want to do theory, and uh, I want to have a lab doing experiments, apply the experiments and the theory to build devices, and why not sell the devices and get money, everything, okay? And I would like to convince you that I am doing this all together, okay? I don't want to be very precise in every topic, but to give you an overview, okay? Then, uh, one of the fields that interests me more now is, uh, for some years, uh, black, okay? Uh, uh, it's a fluid, it's a biofluid, has a complex structure, uh, but it's simple in some aspects. And I want to do the simple things of black. And then, for a long period, it's something like 15 years, I have been working in this field, doing the theory, experiments, and building a company. And I want to talk about all these things. And then, uh, for me, the most simple thing was to study biology. I start to work in, uh, in biology with Eugenia, and uh, was interesting to apply these uh, ideas of uh, rheology in, uh, at the micro scale that makes life easy. And then we talk about this concept of front micro rheology. This means the advance of fluids in a micro channel. This means in a, in a channel of the size of a micron, so of 200 microns, 300 microns. This means that with a very small amount of uh, liquid, you can study the properties of rheology, and rheology is simply the property of the viscosity that a fluid has, and uh, this characterizes many things, as I will try to explain to you. Then, uh, this is a red blood cell, uh, this is, uh, we are seeing here the membrane of the red blood cell. It's a bag with hemoglobin. Uh, when you have in the body, it's in the, in the blood uh, flow. And you have plasma, that is water. You have these cells. And these cells give the elasticity, the viscoelasticity properties of blood. And uh, I, I have studied cells by itself. And then I put the cells in a fluid and see what happened with it. What are the viscous elastic properties of this uh, complex fluid that you have when you have plasma and you have cells. Okay, then I started to work in this field uh, many years ago. 
uh, and my motivation was, for example, here you have an uh, example of a red blood cell. This is the typical shape of a red blood cell. We call this discocyte. And immediately you can see that this, well, it's a beautiful picture. It's very aesthetic and has a property that's important that is very deformable. This means that uh, the size of this uh, cell is 6 microns by 2 microns. It's very elastic, it's very deformable, because one has to go around the micro vessels, for example in the brain, should squeeze a lot and deform, and uh, because in other case can break the vessels, and then you can have a stroke. And for example here you have, this is the, the malaria the, uh, insect that uh, beats you and gives you malaria. And for example here you have a healthy red blood cell, this is a pipette. You make aspiration and you see the deformability of the cell. And here you see that this uh, red blood cell is infected by malaria and then you, it has changed the shape is much more rigid and creates a lot of problems when it's in the body. Okay? Then we are very interested to apply our uh, studies to study malaria. We are collaborating with people in malaria. And the first thing that you can do is to study one cell and then put this cell in the fluid. Okay? And uh, I want to do theory. This means that I want to do mathematics and for me this is a red blood cell that is fluctuating in this case by the presence of thermal fluctuations because it's at some temperature and then you have an equation for to describe the shape of the cell here is the typical uh, uh, phase field equations that you have we start to do this thing with uh, Felix some years ago and we are now interested, for example, this term is taking into account the thermal fluctuations, the, the cell is fluctuating all the time, and this gives you an idea of uh, studying the cell of the elasticity of the bending modulus that this cell has, and this tells you about if the, if the cell is uh, healthy or has some rigidity that tells you that you have some type of disease in, in your in your body. Okay? Uh, then you can do theory, you can study correlation functions, power spectrum. I will not give you the details, but see this is our cell uh, uh, in silica, and this is a photograph of a red blood cell, uh, really uh, a picture. And you can study the fluctuations, the shape of the cell, and you can from this uh, procedure determine the properties of fluctuations and the bending modulus, for example, that tells you these elastic properties. In this case, you can compare two dimensions, three dimensions, to study the power spectrum. Here is the, the bending modulus. When you are in this uh, two-dimensional symmetry, in three dimensions you have this behavior. You can do theory to determine the properties of the cell. Okay, this is only the one that I think is important to remember about the problem. Then, for example, this is a typical example that is a, a biophysics in which you have a budding and tubulation. You have this tubulation produced by a protein. And in our case, we have the numerical simulation. And you see that you have tubulation here that is growing. And we want to compare this type of experiments. And you can also do the circulation like you have, for example, in the Golgi apparatus, here you have a vesicle that is disconnected from the bulk, and this is, for example, when you have garbage in your cell, and you want to take to do exocytosis, and then you take the garbage inside the vesicle and go out. This means that with a mathematical model, very theoretical, you can determine properties that could be applied to determine the properties that you have in biology. This is our main goal. Okay, this was one cell, but now we want to go to study a group of cells. And what happened in this 
case. And for example, here we have, this is, these are the cells, the red blood cells, this is the fluid that will be the plasma, and in this case you have a sample that you look at the microscope, a simple microscope, when you have made the extraction of blood after five days. After five days, you start to see this aggregation that uh, the, the people call the coins or the wall. These are these structures that aggregate in lines and create a lot of problems in the existence of coagulation in some way. Okay? In a different field, for example, that we have also been studying, here you have the examples not of red blood cells, but uh, uh, white cells, and you can, have, you can study cancer. For example, this liquid cancer that is called leukemia. And with also with uh, the blood with uh, leukemia, you can, the objective will be, the aim will be to determine, to, to make diagnosis of this type of cancer in a very simple and fast way as I will explain to you. Okay, then, four, and then why not to start to do experiments? And then we were discussing with uh, Tomás Alarcón, he's in a center of mathematics, that is called Centro de Recerca Matemática, and then uh, he told me, we have a space in our center to build a lab, and we have money to buy a microscope, and, and I say, a rheometer also? This is a rheometer. Okay, let's do experiments. And here you have the microscope, this is a fast camera, really very good camera. And my idea was always to study situations very simple. And the idea is here, this is the experiment, and here you have the microchannel. This is the microchannel. I want to do all my physics in this size, okay? This is the experiment. Here you have the chip. This, this is the... the the, uh, the, the, the picture, and you have a front moving inside the macro channel. Here you have, this is, you are seeing from above, you see this is one millimeter, the height of the micro channel is 200 microns, and the length is four centimeters. And then the idea is you have, you restart in this way, you start with a microscope, you see, you push the fluid, in this case, it's simply water. You put water, you have here the interface separating water and air. You push with a pressure, and you see what happens to the velocity of the front. And for this reason, I call this front microbiology. Because I will study the viscosity at uh, uh, the micro scale, and we will study this uh, viscosity studying the velocity front. And this makes life very easy because with a simple microscope you can determine this velocity. It's not like when you do PEEP, particle limit velocimeter, in which you need partic test particles that tell you what is the velocity. Here this is something that is one millimeter, it's very simple to detect, and it's a possibility to detect and determine the viscosity as a function of the pressure and the velocity of the front. And this is the typical picture. Here you have the front, this is the micro channel, and you see that it's very, very small. Okay, then, for example, this was the, one of the first examples that we study. We study blood, and the simple thing was, I take blood from a bank of blood that we have um, uh, a quadrant, and then we have healthy blood, we have one day, and then you look in the microscope without any dynamics, and you see the red blood cells, and there is no rule, there is no aggregation. And then you wait for five days, and you start to see many rows with these coin structures. You study the viscosity now, you apply this expression that I told you, you make a pressure, you study the velocity, and you can determine the viscosity as a function of the velocity, this is essentially the velocity, when it's essentially plasma, 
the 25% means the hematocrit, the amount of red blood cells in the total volume. And then when the, the, the hematocrit is very small, it's simply like water, and you have a constant value of the uh, viscosity. And we call this an internal fluid. And then when you increase the amount of, of hematocrit, you start seeing that the viscosity is a nonlinear function of the velocity. We call this nonlinear rheology. And when you wait for five days, is for small velocities, the viscosity is very large. And when you push with, fast, with larger velocity, the viscosity is reduced because the cells start to disaggregate and then the, the velocity increases, the viscosity is reduced. Okay? Then, uh, this is one example. You can do things to give you an idea about, for example, making some... Uh, this, if this is the relation between the viscosity and the velocity. You see that it's an algebra uh, relation with an exponent n smaller than 1 that is telling you that the viscosity has this nonlinear relation and uh, making uh, some type of analysis, you can determine the addition number that characterizes the addition between cells in your system, okay? In a very simple way. And this exponent n is telling you a lot about the properties of the blood in this case. These are first experiments that we are doing now, not only to study the evolution of the front by itself, but what happened to the cells in time. We, doing the dynamics of aggregation, I don't know if you can see it, but here you have the cells, and if you wait enough, you start seeing that the rulers, the coin structures, you can see immediately. This is, you, you see in minutes how the uh, cells aggregate. And we are working with Carlos Calero to try to make, to, 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 to see if this process bec is because to have this addition energy that the people believe, or is also the, uh, this a part of the pleasure uh, related to uh, entropy. Okay? Always when you do experiments, some other things appear in the middle. You are starting to discuss it, but you start to say, okay, why not to study other type of problems? Okay, then, now I am going further. We can study these things, but why not to do diagnosis? Why not to study healthy blood and compare with some diseases? and see if we can determine some properties in a very simple way. And for example, in this case, we have, uh, we use this concept, the front microbiology, by making diagnosis, and then we start with healthy samples. The samples are healthy, donors are in the, this bank of blood without any problem, and then we study the same donor the viscosity as a function of the velocity. You push the fluid, you study the friction, the shear, and then you uh, make, you centrifugate the blood, and then you put blood with, has no cells, not red blood cells, and then you start increasing the amount of hematocrit, 25%, 38%, and you observe that this is plasma, this is blood, and you are increasing the hematocrit, the, you have more and more cells, you have more and more viscosity, more and more elasticity in the system. But this is the same donor. And then you can apply an equation that makes a, to scale the, the, all the curves in only one universal curve. And this is the way that you determine that is uh, the same donor that has the same type of cells in the fluid. And then you start with different donors doing the same procedure, and then you see that you can define a, a bending modulus that the, the donors, for example, you see here that the, these two donors have essentially the same uh, bending modulus, and this one has not, it's a little bit different, but you can scale this in one universal line 
in which you can determine what is the value of the bending modulus to make this a scale, a, a, a scale curve. And this, you can say that is the a curve for healthy blood. Okay. Well, the next step is, okay, you can do this with a microscope. Why we don't do this electrically? Okay. And this was my postdoc, that, is, that uh, she is Mexican, she's in Barcelona, and she told me, I have a husband that is an uh, electrical engineer, and he knows these things. I said, okay, wonderful, all in family. Okay, and then <coughs> the, the guy that is the electrical engineer put these electrodes in the microchannel. Okay, and now the front is moving inside the microchannel, and the microchannel the electrode, when you have the front of blood advancing in the microchannel, is detecting the presence of this front in time. Then if you determine, the, you here you have the electrodes, and then uh, you see that the distance between electrodes is the same. And now you simply determine, calculate the time that the uh, front takes to move from electrode to electrode. And from there, you determine the velocity. And then here, you have an example. Look at that. This is telling you that you have the front advancing. And here, the front will appear. That's it. OK, then we say, OK, why not? To make a patent, we send the patent to Europe. And then they say, OK, this is original. And now our, we have now the US patent. I have to say that the help of center of research, of mathematical research, has been very, very important. Because to do all these things is very complicated, very bureaucratic, and they did everything. OK? And this is very important. No, but we have the, the, the title of the patent is a, a methodus, application, and device to do blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, and then the first thing that we did with this uh, micro, micro rayo electroreometer was to have the leukemia. We have leukemia uh, blood, and then with different donors. The donor one is the one that has more uh, uh, white cells in blood, and you can detect the difference in viscosity. And you see the viscosity has this nonlinear behavior with the exponent n is more than one. Okay? Okay. Well, then, uh, now we can start to work with different diseases, and we have to prepare a well defined apparatus to study that. And this is the apparatus to start. Here you have, now we have not anymore the microscope. We don't need uh, anything very fancy. We, need, we have here the red blood cell uh, sample with uh, plasma. The blood is here. Here is the tube. These are, this is the micro channel with the electrodes. This is a national instrument card that is connected with a PC. And then, when the, the front is moving in the microchannel, this thing detects the, si the signal and makes the prediction. This is the thing. Here you have the sample. You have a pressure, a pump, that is pushing the fluid. The sample is going to the microchannel. The car is telling you in the, micro in the terminal of the computer that you have this velocity. Next step, let's contact with different uh, uh, foundations, uh, laboratories, everybody that is related to blood in the near of Barcelona, Vallebron Clinic, the Josep Carrera, the Leukemia, Josep Carrera Foundation, all very interested to have their samples to be studied in our group. And then we don't know now what to do with all these samples. It's crazy. I mean, so many samples that we have no time 
to do <laughs> all the calculations. But okay, this is a problem we have to arrange. Okay, and then this is something that I have not to say because this is confidential. Okay, but we have here, we have here blood that is irradiated and uh, with cesium and has some implications because uh, they say, I have these friends uh, told me that they, they work in uh, blood with irradiation. Uh, they told me that, well, this is, you don't need, you don't have to say anything about that because it's, it's something uh, strange. Uh, I mean, it's confidential, okay? Why? If in Paris you have a bomb with cesium or uh, any uh, uh, reactive uh, 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 bomb and uh, you have 20,000 people affected by that, okay, you need 48 hours to detect if you are sick or not. And you can, we, with our procedure, can detect this in five minutes, okay? Have some implications. Okay, then what is this? Here we have irradiated blood, very small amount of blood, and for example, this one is with no uh, radiation. This one is one gray, and this one is two grays. If you have five grays, you are dead. With two grays, you could go to the hospital. They tell me these things. And one gray is difficult to detect. And here are the results. And you see that for a small velocities, the viscosity is affected by that. What it means? This means that when we were discussing about that, the radiation uh, creates, uh, affects the membrane of the red blood cell and makes the red blood cell more rigid. And when the, the velocity is uh, small, this that is the, the, the one with a lot of radiation uh, has a lot of viscosity. And when you increase the, the, the velocity, many cells break and then you cross the lines in the other direction. The one with more radiation go here and the one with less, no radiation go to the other side. And these are the first steps to uh, study radiation in this way, okay? Well, these things look very exotic, uh, but we are doing this, I mean, this is serious people. And they gave, they gave us the samples and, and they say, I don't tell you what is the gray. If it's one, two, five, or 10, and we have to be like crazy, the, the, and, and A, B, C look like, like a, a, a quiniela, no? I mean, very strange thing. At, at large shear rates, and now the viscosity is smaller for the large gray, I mean, for the last variation. Uh, what I'm saying is that you could also find another red curve, which uh, looks more like the, uh, the blue and the, and the green ones at the large uh, shears. Yeah, but look that we are very interested in the small shears. Huh? We want, we want to, des to describe the, the effect because it's when the, the radiation is, is makes the viscosity large. Here, no, the cell... You cannot because the reason why it goes down is because you break the cells. So yeah. the viscosity of a, a, a solution with broken cells is less viscosity mm -hmm. than yeah. uh, uh, normal. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. So at this share, you don't break cells. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, for this reason, doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then, this is uh, over samples that I don't know how. Okay. Okay. Then, this is a collaboration with a foundation of Josep Carreras. Josep Carreras, probably you know, he's a tenor in the old times. 
and he, he had leukemia. And he was, he's very rich. And then he decided to create a foundation that is called Josep Carreras to study leukemia. And it's a very important center. And then uh, we were talking about this possibility to, to have samples of uh, uh, diseases, and they were very happy, okay? And then uh, the first thing that we are doing is to study uh, uh, diseases. Now we know that you have the sample has a disease that is uh, related to hemolytic anemias. These are anemias. This means that the blood has a small number of red blood cells, genetic, in a genetic way, okay? And then, uh, in this case, for example, in the disease that is called spherocytosis, is because the sample is not, uh, it has not shape, the red blood cells has not the shape of a discocyte, but are more spherical or elliptical, okay? And for example, here you have the healthy ones, and uh, here, for example, you have you are increasing from uh, the discocyte to the elliptical to the spherical, and the viscosity is changed. These are preliminary results in which you see this effect. Okay? Uh, this is mm, the first group that will have our prototype to make the thing, uh, uh, to, to have a lot of samples, because they always have a lot of samples if they study this thing. And other example, Tell me. Why don't you have a, a similar behavior when the, you have a healthy cell that the viscosity becomes more or less constant? Why do you have to Because this is very large. No, this one. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Ah, because the yeah, because here the viscosity is incredibly large. I mean, here you have yeah. te 10 millipascals per second. And then yeah, the, scale, the, the, scale. the scale is different. Okay. And for example, this is xerocytosis, that is, uh, the, is another uh, genetic anemia, and it's because the, uh, the red blood cell lose water. It's deshydratate. Okay? And then immediately you have the effect, I mean, all, other time you have uh, the, 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 the effect. This is the case with plasma, without not, you don't have the, the, the cells. Then this is the healthy one. Here, the, the serocytosis makes this value, okay, the scale is over time changed, and you, have, you start to see the first effect in this case. This means that with different uh, samples, with different uh, uh, problems, uh, thrombocytosis, this is another collaboration with the Hospital de San Pau. Uh, in this case, you have uh, coagulation, ag agglomeration, and uh, over time you have plasma and uh, healthy, and uh, thrombosis, okay? And you see over time the effect. Okay, then let's change a little bit. Uh, now we know that, it, yeah. Different diseases have different we are studying this thing. We are studying this thing. Otherwise it's exactly, yeah. But uh, in principle, the first uh, results that we have, it, it, we are uh, comparing the curves and they look very different. And we have the comparison of these curves to curves of different apparatus, for example, in Josep Carrer and all that. And for example, they change the amount of salt that you put in the fluid, and you have results, and we can compare with that, and make, we need more time to finally decide what is the exponent. But I, I have a, a bio uh, engineer in my group that she's doing the experiment, and I told her, but yeah, but we will say N and M is 0.1, point, and she's a biologist, and she said, well, it's like a chemical analysis when you take blood in analysis, no? You have a problem in your kidney, is that N and M give some value. This will be the same, okay? Now I will tell you about the apparatus. Okay, then, uh, let's go a little bit back to equations. This is a, 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 a dynamic equation giving you the evolution of a red blood cell uh, in a microchannel. 
This is a parameter that tells you where is the red blood cell. Move with a velocity V pushed by the plasma. Has a chemical potential that is the de derivative of a free energy that uh, has this uh, uh, bending energy here, the conservation of area uh, in this term. This is navier stokes equation with mass as acceleration, the, the gradient of pressure, the viscosity, the coupling between the cell and the chemical potential. This means that we can go back to theory and we have this result. We have uh, this recent results with more cells. And for example, this in this case, we are seeing that we have a macro channel. This is the plasma, this is the red blood cell. And in this case, you see that the, the cell change the shape and move out of the center of the channel and in this way reduce friction. And when you study the viscosity, you see that in this case, is the uh, bending uh, energy that is changing because the, the morphology is changing, the position is changing, the orientation is changing, makes this nonlinear uh, effect between the viscosity and the uh, bending number, okay? And now here we have done this for many cells and uh, the most interesting result here is that when you have one cell, it takes an orientation out of the center of the channel, when you have many cells and you increase the velocity, this is increasing the velocity, they cooperate one to the other and become more horizontal. They don't have this angle, okay? And the viscosity is also nonlinear, okay? Okay, my company. to reduce friction. It's, the, it's, the, it's, it's called a sleeper. You see also experimentally. I mean, the, the way is it, uh, when, you, when you have the, the bending energy that minimizes the shape, lose the, the, the symmetry. It's, it's the sleeper. You recover the symmetry when you go to very large velocities. But there is a transition in which the, the shape is not symmetric. It's got a sleeper. And you observe experimentally also. Okay, this is my company. I am very happy about that. And it is called Rio. Rio means in Greek motion. And this means the diagnosis by motion. Okay? The, the, the river Rhin in, in, in Germany comes from this uh, origin. It's moving. Okay? We want to study the motion of fluids and make diagnosis. Okay, and then in this uh, company we have the center, the university, and ventures that is this uh, 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 the United States Foundation that organized this uh, universal uh, 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 meeting about mobiles in Barcelona. That is a very big event, and his the headquarters are in Barcelona, and we have a space there. They uh, make. They give us money to be there, and this is the program, and all this together makes the company. <laughs> I am very proud about that also. We have now, we, we were start, we were four in the company, now we are seven. And uh, I am Sims, the research strategist, okay? And this is my this uh, 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 graduate student doing biology, this is master administration, and this is an engineer. What is the thing that we are doing to make life simple? That, okay? This is the apparatus, and we want to sell that, like an espresso machine, an espresso machine, smaller, okay? This is very cheap, this is plastic, it's very simple, and tell you, tell you hello, okay, it's a display here, and you push the button, say welcome, what is the pressure that you want, it's a suction, it's a, in, 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 here, 
And then this is the way that you have the consumables, all that, the vacuum. You see, here is the, the, the chip that you put, that is, that is the capsule that you take out. And this is the price, that important thing that you buy. Very cheap, but you buy. You put the, the, the chip inside, you cross, and you put the drop of liquid that go through the microchannel, study the velocity, and gives you the curve. Up, up, up. And we are trying now, this is the machine, we are trying to do different things. This is a collaboration with another group to make things simpler. And for example, in this case, you have For example, pressure is very important. You put pressure there, and the, this is a modular pump. OK. And then the thing moves. And we want to do this uh, in a different, this will be a different pattern. We are studying all these things. OK. We are doing the model, and it's not so simple. Looks very simple, but it's not so simple. Because this thing is doing vacuum. And then this moves and it's suction and it's, it's, a, it's not so simple. Okay, then now relax is a, I have f four minutes, five minutes. Okay, then you can study many things now because uh, one possibility, for example, was well, to study all these uh, anemias, all that, but malaria is an important problem in the world. Many children in Africa die from malaria. And to have a detection very fast is very important. And you can do, now you can do different things. You can study malaria, for example, to study the viscosity, and it's one of the things that we are doing. We are studying malaria in a different way. And for example, I am very happy about this thing, this is called pitting. I have results of this pitting, new results. What is this pitting? Pitting in Spanish is deshuesar. Deshuesar. And what is, why is pitting is uh, deshuesar? In, in malaria, you have the red blood cell is in fact infected by a parasitum, and the parasitum eats the hemoglobin and uh, uh, destroys the membrane and kills the cell. Okay? Then, the idea is if you take out the parasitum inside of the cell, maybe the cell could be healthy other time. But the question was, will be the, the, the membrane broken at the moment that the parasitum is going out of the cell? And then our results, look at that. These are post, okay? The size of this post are 10 microns, and the separation of the post are two microns. This is, more, this is complicated to fabricate. Really, it's not so simple. And then you have the red blood cells here, and these black points are the parasitum. And then you can see it's like a play. You can see the play many times. And you have cells that are moving, for example, here. And then you see the cell is moving. The parasitum is here. And it stay there. And then the cell becomes healthy. OK? You, you see? It's, is, you, you see parasitums here, other moves, here one, other one moving, okay? Plasmodium, okay. And then here you have fluorescent microscope images in which you see these cells have been, they are fluorescent when they had plasmodium at some point, and after to be in, the, in our device, it has been clean, and there is healthy other time. And then, this is the fluorescence microscope result. For example, here you study the hemolysis. This, for example, we were checking if the membrane was broken or not. And for example, here you have non-infected blood. Here is infected blood. When you put saponin, you break the membrane. And in this case, for example, you put the chip, and you see that the chip doesn't uh, make the, break the membrane. Okay? And, for example, here, you do cytometry. 
and you see that when you have infected cells, okay, this part, this corner here, tells you what is the amount of cells that were infected and has become healthy over time. And it's something like the 30% of the cell are healthy when you are using our device. Okay. These are not very nice pictures, but this is telling you that in, the, in malaria, really the thing that happened is that the viscosity is decreased because the cells are broken. And we want to study previous effects, but the first effect is that the mal... Yes. Yeah, increases viscosity, but when the velocity is very large, are broken. Okay. And this is the last picture, and this is an artificial spleen. Here you have the post, and a spleen in Spanish is bafo. Okay. Bafo cleans the cells when they are not healthy. If it, they are rigid, here you have the post, and you see there was some of them that they stay there, and the ones that passed are more elastic. Okay? And then this is the first steps to go in the direction to have lap on a chip. And Eugenia say, stop. She asked me to fail her, <laughs> because when it comes to Is, is this working? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this uh, spectacular talk. Very nice, Aurora. And um, thank you all for being here. So, uh, time for questions. Cecilia, please. Uh, Aurora, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a very simple question. Uh, the, the cells are of uh, the size of microns as well as the, the microchannels, or at least this, this uh, last. So, which is the limit of the Navier-Stokes uh, equations? Oh. Because it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> to deal with this. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, really, Navier-Stokes uh, aguanta lo que sea. Okay. Navier-Stokes is always true. <laughs> no, because uh, you are thinking in a continuous, huh? no? you, are, you are thinking in a continuous moon, uh, but uh, with the red cells, which are of the same size of the microchannels, probably you it's have to take into account different, it's, it's different I mean, things. This, this paper by Binder some years ago asking about this question, and he says with 10 cells, 10 particles of this size, it, it still never stock is working well. I mean, okay. it's very robust. Yeah, well, actually, in nanoscience, also the elastic uh, theory is very robust. In yeah. It's amazing. And, and, and another simple question. For example, if you take the blood of uh, a kid or you know, a child or, or uh, an adult, uh, whatever, uh, it's uh, still very robust, the, the, the kind of... Uh, I mean, how, how much specific is uh, this well, test? We have not tried child because maybe the, somebody will tell us something. I mean, uh, we are using a donor from an uh, anonymous donor from the very beginning, and now that we have the connection with these foundations and this lab, we know. But all are adults. But I think I mean the effects. At the, we are always looking at the effects at the membrane, and for example. Uh, the biologists were discussing if, if it's a male or a female, it will be some effect. In principle, it uh, seems that we are, uh, because in, in the case of irradiation, we have the two collaborators of mine are giving the blood, of the, and we know that, and she was happy to demonstrate that she is the same as the man. <laughs> Our blood is the same, we're lucky. <laughs> 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 Questions? One second. 
Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, the question is, I think still you have to introduce the tension forces at the, that are scale related. And there's maybe they are in the potential of, uh, in, the, in, the, in the other, in the other. Tension, you yes. Mean, uh, or line tension? Yes. Yeah. We introduce line tension to be sure that the membrane, that the area of the membrane doesn't change. Because it's full, I mean, it's, it's the, it's inter the, the, the li lipids of the membrane are fixed. I mean, with uh, Raphael, we have, um, have other models in which we take out this condition because, for example, you have a bacteria or something and then you want to create a, a, a wall and then you take out the surface tension condition. But here in the, in the, in the cells, you have uh, the, the surface tension like a Lagrange parameter to ensure you that the area is fixed. And also the volume is fixed. These are the two Lagrangian parameters that tells you that, that you need to, to use in, in, uh, in cells. So the, the other question is related to the, to the market plan of your device. Is, is it expensive? It's very, very cheap. I mean, uh, I start the device uh, with a, a, a programa del Plan Nacional de Física in Spain. This means that it's nothing. <laughs> okay. And then uh, my collaborators in the, in, the, in the company, they ask me, they call me and say, well, it's the, the end of the company. Why? What happened? They told us that the chip is 100 euros. I say, forget it. It's 55 cents. And then this was the five, the two, the 100 euros was in Catalonia. And in Slovenia, it's 25 cents. It's nothing. Very cheap. And in China? <laughs> well, the, pro the problem is that the patent, the patent is very expensive. And we decide to have the patent in Europe and in the United States. And I ask the medical doctors, and home maybe will not be happy, but say, <laughs> we have to patent in China, and they told us, forget it. For medicine, it's not important because we don't care about them. And then we have not the patent in China. Home, what do because you Because they will make their own patent. <laughs> <laughs> they will not respect. Home, she's expecting a reaction from you. No, <laughs> The, the, <laughs> the important thing of our patent that we are very proud because you can do a patent uh, without uh, exploitation and then it's like a paper, it's nothing, it's a publication. We have our patent uh, that is an exploitation by our, by our company and then they pay all the price of all the, in all Europe and will be in the United States. It's very expensive but we will do that. Uh, James, please. I guess we could talk about commercialization over lunch, since that's something I'm, I'd like to learn from your success, having had of some many failures of companies that I've started over the years. Uh, but uh, I was going to ask you a question about uh, consistency. Uh, you have these nice results for blood samples. If you sample the same pa person at different times of day, when they've eaten and they haven't eaten, what do you see? Because when you think about diabetes, diabetes has, a, diabetes has huge effects on uh, vascular function, and we know a fair amount about how it affects the blood vessel walls, but it also affects blood properties. And I was wondering how much you might be able to use yeah, this Yeah, it's very important, the diabetes. protocol. The protocol is very important. In fact, uh, when the, the, the idea is you take the blood, you go to the refrigerator, you have the, the blood in the refrigerator for some time, you put at uh, ambient temperature. I mean, it's very important, but the point in our uh, apparatus is that the idea is to have the sample immediately put in the, in the channel. This means that the, the apparatus will be with the medical doctor, you will have a puncture of the, of the drop of blood, you will put immediately in the apparatus, and we will do all the control of quality in this uh, immediate effect. Sorry, 
Have you compared your analysis for fasting and non-fasting blood? Yes. And, and, and the effect is, is very important. And so you see a big difference? Uh, you, uh, immediately. Okay, if it's, uh, if it's okay with everybody, is that Rafael wants to prove that Mexicans are tough. We are going to make a toast at 10 in the morning. So there's some wine. <laughs> so do we thank Aurora for her wonderful talk again, please? And we'll continue the discussion. Oh, sí, sí, eso no, no tengo ninguna duda, o sea, no se van a librar de mí. <laughs> Gracias. ¿Tú quieres probar esto? No. no. ¿Quién está a cargo de las cosas de.? Es que la plática que sigue es mía, lo siento, Félix. Tú lo pruebas en el Porque la plática que sigue es mía. Bueno, en el Ah, muy bien, muchas gracias. A ver. Espera, de, ay, déjame que, que tengo mis, mis cacharritos ver, aquí. Un segundo, euro. A ver. Yo tengo por aquí. Uy, a mí se me oye todo, ¿no? Perdón. Sí, sí, ¿me, me puedo desconectar eso? Esta es la mía. Sí, vas con el micro, buenas, ¿verdad? Vale. Sí. Tengo el, la, el conector también. Bueno, muy bien, ¿te ha gustado? Sí. Bueno, mucho. Ya fui medio mexicana. Bueno, muy bien. Ya lo era, pero. Ya, y con todos estos atuendos mexicanos. Vale, perfecto. Ya va. Vale, gracias. A mí me tienen que quitar esto. Eugenia, tú tienes esta cosa, ¿eh? Sí. A ver, rotame. Mira, lo dejo aquí. Pero como siempre se desfigura todo, a veces sale, a veces no.
Yes. <coughs> okay, I'll initiate my chronometer. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy uh, to welcome uh, Aurora, I'm very happy that Rafael had the idea of organizing this symposium in her honor for her induction to the Mexican Academy of Science. And uh, so first I have to say congratulations, Aurora, and we are all very happy to have you here. Uh, also, I would like to uh, tell you that since the idea of organizing the symposium was uh, Raphael's idea, Raphael asked me to talk about the history of my collaboration with Aurora. And Aurora, no, 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 please don't talk about the Stone Age. But Raphael won, you know, and then I will talk about the days before papers and scissors, but hopefully I will reach modern, time, modern times. Uh, so do you know the game of paper, scissors, and stone, and they only had stones. So they, always <laughs> they could always beat stone before papers and scissors. So that, uh, very good. So I also, uh, before I start, I want to thank, actually, uh, Hong Guo, my PhD supervisor, because thanks to him, I met Aurora. Aurora and, and Hong Guo were, uh, friends in Pittsburgh when Aurora was doing a postdoc and hung, on, and hung his PhD thesis. So Hong introduced me to Aurora, I think in 92, in which we went to a Rutgers meeting and then went uh, to New York to have a fabulous uh, weekend. Okay. So basically, uh, the title of my talk is Face Field Models and Response Functions because these are the two main areas in which our Aurora and I have collaborated. So uh, Aurora already introduced phase field models, but this is the first model that we introduced to study fluids. So you basically have another parameter that varies continuously between two phases separated by an interface. This chemical potential assures that in equilibrium you can have any of these two phases, and this term allows for spatial variations of the order parameter and allows for the existence of the interface. Uh, in the, uh, this, this thing uh, can be mathematically proof to give the hydrodynamic equations for, for the fluids in the limit when this interface is sharp. So in that limit, you get uh, Laplace uh, equation for the pressure at the bulk of the fluids, and for the interface, you have like the normal velocity is proportional to the to the pressure gradient, and you have Laplace condition that says that the pressure in the two sides of the interface is proportional to the uh, curvature and, um, and has the surface tension as, as parameter. So we did several uh, things with this. So this is the paper in which we introduced this, this phase field model for fluids, and we study the basically the this stabilization of a flat interface, but using uh, this phase field model, competition of fingers, and finally, uh, steady state fingers. So this was our first paper together in 2003. We then did you, I don't know if you recognize this guy, believe it or, or not, he's Rodrigo, you know, when, when he was beautiful. <laughs> we study uh, the lateral, uh, we study the viscous fingering problem, but uh, forcing the system with a periodic, uh, with a periodic uh, signal. So we, uh, we found that the, the finger develops a lateral instability that in some regimes has a wavelength independent of the incident frequency. So of course at very low frequencies, the, 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 the finger follows adiabatically, no? the, the forcing, but then it has a, a selection uh, regime. We then use the same, uh, we use the same uh, phase field model to study quench disorder, yeah? the Safman Taylor fingers, but in the presence of static noise. 
And we observe that the same type of instability, of course, this is not periodic because the, the noise is random. And, and this is uh, flat because of the scale, but the tip is the same of the, of the Safman Taylor finger. These were our first uh, collaborations. And then here's a historical picture of the first day that we did experiments together. So this is Mireya Torralba who did the experiment. And this was published like four years later because everything takes uh, a long time to be published. But here you can see the side of the finger. Of course, there were no iPhones. I, I did it with a like, pocket camera and very roughly. Uh, but that was the start of our experimental collaboration. Our collaboration has been basically theoretical, but we have three, uh, we have co-directed three experiments uh, together. So here are two of them. The, we, we set the experiment to explain, to, to confirm our results of the, of the phase field model. So we put random uh, noise by putting uh, copper uh, squares in the cell, and we observed this lateral instability. It's a long wavelength, so you cannot see it unless you compress the finger when in the presence of static noise. And then we observe the same. Here's a zoom in the presence of periodic forcing. Okay, the periodic forcing of the of the pressure at the entrance. So this is a. You can see the scale, this is compressed, and if you see a zoom, you see that there is a wavelength there uh, using the velocity and the wavelength, you can associate like a frequency to this instability, and there's a regime at small frequencies in which it goes basically linear with the incident frequency, but there is another regime in which the response gets, is almost independent of the frequency, and there's a selection process here. Okay. So, but now, since I am going to change topic, let me put some fun pictures because Aurora and I had been doing face fields and experiments, but we also were doing some th fun things. So, uh, we have done things in Spain, in Catalonia, this is a courtesy for Felix. Uh, we have done also more exotic things in places where you cannot travel now, like Syria, Afamia, Damascus, in Jordan. So, I have rescued her from jail, I think, once in Aleppo. And uh, these, are, these pictures are in Turkey, in San Frambolo and Cappadocia. So, we have, uh, in this, at the same time we do physics, we explore the world, and we drink wine. So, okay, so look at that. Uh, system, this is a microfluidic system. I will just restart the movie because the rest is actually not important. Uh, I just didn't have time to cut it, okay? So basically, in microfluidics uh, that Aurora already talked about, the fluids are confined in microchannels. Flow is generally in the laminar regime. Uh, Fluids can be Newtonian or viscoelastic, and the surface properties like wetting and roughness are of fundamental importance because they would determine the large or low resistance to flow. Now, I put this picture because intentionally or unintentionally, in microchips, many times fluids are subject to pulsatile forcing. There are many microfluidic devices in which you have drops, and you can have lateral channels, you know, in which the, the path of the droplets will be felt. So we decided to study uh, this with a, with a methodology of response functions. So very briefly, uh, for instance, you just take any constitutive equation, plug it into a momentum balance. I, I took, for example, here uh, Maxwell fluid. And if, if you, you go to frequency domain to solve the equations easily, if you get the Newtonian fluid, you recover Navier-Stokes equation. And basically, you have relationships between velocity and pressure gradient. And once you solve for a particular boundary conditions and average over the channel uh, area, a cross-sectional area, you get rid of this spatial dependence and you have uh, a velocity and gradient of pressure related 
with, uh, with a function of frequency that we are going to call a response function or dynamic permeability. So this is basically uh, a measure of the resistance to flow and depends on frequency. And just to give you an idea of how it looks like, for Newtonian fluids, it decreases monotonically. So it means that if I do the forcing with this frequency, the, the magnitude of the flow will be higher, like this, the blue arrow corresponds to this magnitude of flow. If I pulse with a higher frequency, since the response is smaller, the magnitude of the flow will be smaller, okay? So this had been uh, used in all time, uh, yeah, and then for viscoelastic fluids, this response is non-monotonic, so if you pulse at the frequency that maximizes the permeability, you get the highest flows. If you pulse uh, at other frequencies, you have smaller magnitudes of flows. So Aurora and I have used this uh, for several things. So for instance, a proposal to measure dynamically the slip length in Newtonian fluids, so we basically propose to do two, two different cells, no? because of the scaling properties of the equations, we realize that if you measure in, in different cells with different lengths and different frequencies, you, we can have this ratio and determine the slip length, which is an alternative because slip length is hard to measure normally because people measure milliliters per minute you know, to to determine which is the, the slip length in a system. We also use this uh, to stratify a fluid. So here you have a, a microchannel, and if you drive the system at the resonance frequency, this can be split in three, five, seven different virtual microchannels, which are channels within the real physical microchannel. So in principle, you could be testing different things, you could have different tracer particles here, and since the diffusion is low, there is like a time in which you are pulsating, uh, pulsing the fluid, creating these virtual layers, and as long as diffusion has not mixed the layers, you can test different things. Oh my god. Uh. Okay, so, no, I thought there was something with the computer, but it's just the door. We also used uh, this to study viscoelastic fluids in the presence of sleep. Uh, we generalize our theory, so we don't need a Maxwell fluid. We can take any experiment and, and put a relaxation modulus of any, of, of any substance into our theory. And what, this, uh, what the sleep creates is a shift in the curves of the response function. So by slightly changing the chemical properties of the substrate at the, at the given frequency, you can have that one or the other channel treated chemically has the highest flow magnitude. Okay, so we went back to study interfaces, but this time in microfluidics. So this was, uh, I think, the a, a, a very nice thing that luckily Aurora didn't present today, but present yesterday in a seminar at the Faculty of Chemistry. We studied a front, a hydrophobic uh, front, and we were studying the, the front position and the velocity as a function of time, okay, for low pressure and hydrophobic microchannels. And we observed that the velocity the distribution of the velocity fluctuations follows the distribution of rare events exactly as the stock market or earthquakes or things like that. So this was explained with a phase field model um, made by Mark. I couldn't find a picture of Mark in this old time, so I, I could not make you the before and after. So lucky, luckily you, <laughs> lucky you, Mark. Uh, so this. It's parts, yeah. yeah. So, his, he, yeah, Maria did the experiments and Mark did the, the face field, okay? Uh, so, this was explained by a series of pinning and avalanches. You know, the front gets pinned until the fluid accumulates here and then it jumps to the next obstacle. And that's the mechanism of, of this thing. Okay, so, let me, now I have, very good. 
11 minutes for what we are doing uh, recently. Well, this is a, an accepted paper. Even our, our family names are still not fine because these are the proofs of a paper accepted, uh, which is about enhancing the vision from the cooperation between wetting and inertia via pulsatile forcing. Uh, I have put this because this is the first time in which we have integrated phase field models and response functions. So basically, uh, these have been our two uh, main topics of collaboration, and in this one, we were able to integrate both. So basically, we propose a new phase field model uh, in which we uh, introduce a second derivative if time of the order parameter, which in the sharp interface limit corresponds to an acceleration term. This is very important because even though we were studying pulsatile uh, forcing things with the other model, the system is always accelerated. So there has to be regimes in which it's not correct to, talk, to take the other, uh, the other model. And we introduce... Inertia is very short-lived, right? Sorry? Short-lived. No, hold on, because it's very short-living if you let the system relax. But if you are forcing the, the system all the time, it's all the time important. Acceleration is always present in the system. So let me show you what we get. So the, the macroscopic equations are the same ones for the bulk. The, the Laplace condition of the jump of the pressure is the same one. But when, when we have a new equation for the velocity at the interface in which we have an acceleration term. If you put this zero, it's like the old phase field model, right? Without this term and without this term. So we will study a system in the presence of wetting. This boundary condition gives you, uh, gives you a way of imposing if the, if the wall prefers the fluid or the, or the air or it's uh, the same for both. Okay, so first for the case of neutral wetting, since the, the wall likes the same air and, and, and fluid, you have a flat interface. You start pushing with a, with a periodic interface with a certain frequency. And when you follow in the phase field integration, the interface position, you right away see that the amplitude at smaller frequencies is larger than the amplitude at larger frequencies. Okay. So this is the, the macroscopic equation that we got. If uh, we just uh, put it in, in one dimension, uh, pass it to the, to the frequency domain and take the magnitude, we have this response function between velocity and pressure gradient, right? So we plot two things here. One is this analytical term, which is the dotted line. And then we plot the results of the phase field integration in two cases at constant uh, inertia parameter and at constant frequency. How so alpha? I'll go to that, uh, but we have comparison with everything. I'll, I'll, I'll go to real values, okay? Because this alpha, if I tell you 400 or 800, means nothing, right? But we'll relate that to, to density and, and real things. OK, that, which is, I think, what I like about this paper. Uh, so now I want to, to compare with real fluids. So let me again remind you that Darcy's law that I presented you, I just put the response function, I pass it to the other side, OK? So this is the relation coming from Navier stocks, right? Integrated in the, in the channel. Uh, that relates pressure gradient and velocity in frequency domain. This is a complicated thing that would give me really, uh, in time domain, an integral equation between velocity and pressure gradient. But then we had the following idea. Why don't we, we, we want a differential equation similar to the one that we have in the phase field model. So we expand this to first order in, in omega, and of course, you remember that in frequency domain, a time derivative is related to minus i omega. So this will give me a first derivative in time. This will give me the constant term in velocity. And this will give me the term of the pressure gradient. So now I have from Navier-Stokes, 
or Darcy's, uh, generalized Darcy's with inertia, this equation. And from the phase field model, we have this. So we can now identify alpha as this parameter, which is basically related to density, which it was expected, no? since it's an inertia parameter, and the mobility it related to the system size and the system viscosity as in the old phase field. Okay, so we take this small approximation, take the, the parameters alpha and, and, and mobility and put it in the exact expression for Newtonian fluids. Uh, no, I have still five minutes plus five talks. I put the chronometer. <laughs> I put it in the exact expression for Newtonian fluids, and we get the and we compare the phase field responses with the Navier-Stokes responses, and they are identical. Okay, so for the first time we can merge together the two fields in which we have been working, and we have conversion factors. For example, you can put well, uh, uh, these these are convection conversion factors for water in a micro channel, but I'll come back to this because I want to talk in the last uh, three minutes about hydrophilic walls. If you put hydrophilic walls, this breaks the symmetry, of course, because the interface now, uh, uh, it's, uh, it has a curvature because the wall has a preference for the water and not for, for the air. And this breaks the symmetry between the two parts of the cycle. When you are pushing, the two, the two effects, dri driving and, and wetting, are cooperating and on the other and on the other half of the cycle they are competing. Uh, anyway, since you have uh, these hydrophilic walls, the front advances. You can also see that the amplitude is larger for larger uh, for smaller frequencies, as in the other case. And you can analyze dynamically this dynamic. Uh, you can analyze the behavior of this dynamic angle for the for reference here is like the static angle of water uh, <coughs> in 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 a substrate. Here we have the the dynamic angle. This average uh, is the is the green line, which is the average of the blue curve, even if it doesn't look like, and the red line is the imbibition angle, the normal imbibition non-static angle. Okay, so according to this, the system will go uh, slower, okay, because you are doing this slightly less hydrophilic. But what we observe is that, in fact, the front, when we switch on the driving, it's like takes off and advances much faster than in the case of pure imbibition. And this is because there is a cooperation between the wetting and the inertia at the, at the bulk. So the bulk is winning, okay? Thanks to our conversion factor, uh, this of course is not predicted by the, by the old phase field model in which inertia is not taken into account. So Rafael, you can see here that inertia is relevant as long as the front is feeling the pulsatile forcing because when it's not relevant, these curves will go together. So thanks to our... our That's the only result? You want more? <laughs> that's, a, that's the best result of the paper, let's say. <laughs> and then, thanks to our conversion factor for water with density of water, um, uh, viscosity of water in a 300 micron micro channel, uh, we pulse with all a pressure at the entrance of the channel that is only 3% of the capillary pressure. So it's really a very small noise. And we get that if you pulse, like let's say at, 300 at 35 hertz for seven seconds, the front advances 12% more uh, due to this forcing than if you don't have the forcing. It advances by 12%. Of course, we, will, we would like to have experiments of that, but that would be like in the future. So I have been studying Aurora you know, move with all these years, and I think that there is a fluid-dependent aurora smooth, because you will agree with me. 
See? <laughs> when you have water in Syria, because you are in a Muslim country and you cannot drink wine, then Aurora has this face. When Aurora is like in a decent place like Mexico and a nice restaurant where Rafael takes us to eat, then Aurora is happy. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to have you all here. Twenty-five, twenty-five exactly, eh? Twenty-five zero two. <laughs> Five minutes for questions, yes. What happened with alpha? You have an alpha equals eight hundred. Yes. Eight hundred. Okay. Is that large or small? All all these experiments were done. I the thing is you have to compare with our conversion factor. This is alpha eight hundred, okay? And this, if we put uh, w properties of water, no? So that's why alpha, the expression for alpha was here, OK? So now, to, use a, to, to take my conversion factor, I put a 300 micron microchannel. The density of water, the viscosity of water, and these numerical factors, and I get alpha 800, OK? So it's to give you an idea. I mean, there is a regime in which it's not important to have alpha, OK? If at very small frequencies, so that doesn't mean that the, our historical papers are all wrong. <laughs> because uh, if you have small frequencies, the things follow the, the, the forcing adiabatically. But roughly, uh, this, this alpha will change with the fluid. If it's Depending on, the, on which fluid you are interested, the relevant alpha will be, uh, and, and which frequency are you using for, for pulsatile forcing? Because as you can see, this dependence, it's on the product, a dimensional product, alpha times the forcing frequency. So let's say, Jorge, if we pulse with, uh, with if we have alpha of 400, and we get a frequency of 0 0.0025, this corresponds to alpha 1, okay, to, to alpha omega 1, and that's basically the boundary between alpha being relevant and irrelevant, okay? Yes? Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Long, long time ago in Stone Age. Yes. Yeah. Uh, exactly a liquid with this property, which is called F65, uh -huh. uh, made by 3F uh, factory. Yeah. And actually, all these nonlinear effects, uh, uh, dynamics of behavior of fluid, are enhanced. For a single fluid, you mean? Yeah. Not for any interface. This is like the dynamics of the interface. But yeah, okay. all of this. But yeah. Uh, density of water. Very good. Instead of using water, you use uh, yeah. 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 or fluor in a yeah. these are available commercially. Then you could show a spectacular impact when it's because your expansion allows you to use higher frequency. Okay. <coughs> so we will use that in, in our experiment, Aurora. Let's yeah. keep it in mind. <laughs> Instead of water, it's just that water is cheaper. But I, I think we let's have another question along that path. Yeah. This, this liquid is used industrially in dielectric breakdown. Okay. Thank you, Rafael. Yeah. He needs a microphone. Again. Oh, thank you, uh, pr Professor. I was wondering about the part of stratification. I was thinking in, in the origin, the primitive plants and animals they don't have real vascular systems. I was wondering if this type of st stratification could be related somehow to the origin, to the formation of the first vascular systems. What do you think? I think I am in no position to say that because, you know, for that, I would need to consider an elastic. Uh, for example, this is a rigid cell, okay? I would need to, to consider an elastic membrane that is also able to be deformed and then to get destabilized. I think all these things can be studied 
I mean, pattern formation can be studied with the same tools, but with these fluid phase field models, no. I, I was thinking about that because these fluids, what I have in my mind about it, is basically they are very concentrated fluids. I mean, they are because they are like the plasma of systems, yeah. they, are, uh, they have a strong content of salt and sugar, and probably they have these viscoelastic properties. That's what I was thinking yeah. in this direction. Okay, well, let, let's, uh, let, let's keep this uh, okay. at lunch. Um, I, I think time, we have to keep the time. So uh, okay. let's uh, thank our speaker again. <laughs> and our next speaker, is Felix from uh, ICFO, Spain. He will tell us about uh, shapes in cells. Uh, let's, let's welcome. Y ahora, el micrófono. Can you hear me? Yes? Good. No, okay. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank Eugenia and Rafael for the invitation and of course congratulate Aurora for becoming a member of the Mexican Academy of Sciences. And today I'm going to talk about a bit, I will try to do a bit of the overview of what I've been doing in science since I started my PhD with Aurora already quite a few years ago. And my main research topic is on trying to understand applied physics or biophysics to try to understand the, oops, there's a ghost, <laughs> I can't read, to try to understand how, see, how the, the, within the cells, the membranes or the different organelles or the cells themselves can, can be shaped. And of course, the shaping depends on def different physical factors uh, and different physical energies. Okay, uh, let's see if this works. Yes. So this was, it all started actually in 2003, so I finished my, my degree in physics, so I went to see Aurora in her office in the, in the ground floor, and I mean, I, actually this is not real, it was not exactly like this how it happened, but actually then, during the years in the PhD, she always had her uh, blackboard, and basically there was always the same equation written, like, <laughs> like carved in stone in the, in the, in the blackboard, which was as you all heard already in the, in the initial talks, the, this kind of dynamic, general dynamic equation for the, for the phase field. Okay, so yeah, she was, I mean, I, I, she, she was my teacher in stati uh, statistical mechanics. I liked it very much. So I, I wanted to do something like that, but I really wanted to do more, something more applied into biology or some more physical, uh, biophysical sciences. But she said, yeah, sure, you can do, we can do whatever, don't worry, we'll, we'll manage. That was, that's always been somehow the approach of Aurora. If you want to do something, don't worry, we'll, we'll manage, we'll, we'll do it somehow. So she said, yeah, fine, so we have this office, you can take this office. This was, again, already in 2003. And yeah, so Eugenia put a very nice picture of Rodrigo before, so I have to flagellate myself because I also found <laughs> a very bad picture of myself. So that was when I started my PhD there in the University of Barcelona. And this is when I was looking at, because I was looking for pictures, I really feel a bit old now because you see this kind of big, large computer screens and these old fashioned cell phones that you find nowadays almost in the design museums. But yeah, so then, as I said, I wanted to do more biophysics. So yeah, so Aurora said, yeah, sure, we can do biophysics. I have this very good friend and he's a, collaborator, Joel Stavans, who's actually Mexican, and he's a, a professor in, in the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And he had very interesting results, quite recent results, 
where they were, as also Dora mentioned before, they were studying uh, um, lipid vesicles or lipid membranes, okay, in vitro, in an ex experimental system, and they were adding something that mimics somehow the effect of proteins anchoring into, the, into these membranes. Okay? And what they were doing is that they were studying this kind of dynamic instability. So you started, for instance, with a tubular, a more or less cylindrical tube, and then upon addition of this polymer, which was mim mimicking the proteins, they, they uh, observed this kind of purling instability. Okay? So the shape of a cylindrical tube was changing into something like a set of spheres, which were still connected, by the way. Okay. So this was one of the experiments, so I found this really, really nice because I somehow always like this kind of trying to understand how things are shaped and what energies or what physical principles uh, lead to these uh, shape changes. And besides being something that I was really curious about and we were curious about, it turns out that it's actually important for, for the biology because within the cells you find really many kinds of different shapes. And as, as you might know, in, in, the, in the cells, so that the basic compartmentalization within the cells is made by membranes. Okay? The membranes separate, for instance, what's inside the nucleus from outside the nucleus, the, what's called the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, endosomes, uh, even the plasma membrane. And these membranes have very, very curved uh, parts or parts with very peculiar shapes, for instance, like the Golgi complex, which is like a, a stack of, of pancakes. Okay? So again, all these shapes, understanding how, how the membranes are shaped is quite important not only from a more or less a academic point of view, but also for a really fundamental biological point of view. So then we, we went to the, to the origins to try to understand, so what is the energy that drives the shape or how, what is the penalty when you change the shape of a membrane? And that was the, the, actually the, one of well, basically the initial paper from, from Kahneman Kahn, in, the, in, the, in 1970, where back at the time people wondered what, why the shape of a red blood cell, this kind of di discocyte shape of a red blood cell emerged from. Okay? So this paper is, I mean, it, it's quite nice, but it's, it's very simple. So they just said, okay, we have like a family of curves, which is parametrized by a simple parameter, B, okay? And they were looking, of course, surface tension, it's not surface tension, and they had like some kind of bending energy. Okay, like curvature energy, and they saw that in this case, this kind of curvature energy was minimized at the shape that resembled the shape of the red blood cell. So later in, two, uh, 2000, in 1973, Helfry have had the, the more established or more formal analysis of, of the elasticity of a, of a bilayer, of a membrane, okay? and basically he uh, demonstrated that uh, and also with analogy to basically to the, to the energy of, of pneumatic liqui uh, liquid crystals, which if you think about them, it's quite similar to what a bilayer is, because a bilayer or a membrane is composed of these lipids, which are more or less like what you would think about of a pneumatic liquid crystal. So basically, the free energy or the energy, the elastic energy of a piece of membrane depends on the two curvatures, the two principal, well, uh, the total, what's called the total curvature and the Gaussian curvature of the membrane. There's a parameter which is somehow the, what's called the spontaneous curvature. It's the preferred curvature a membrane would like to have if possible. And then, of course, two elastic parameters, the bending rigidity and the Gaussian modulus. Okay? Oops, sorry. So, yeah, this is basically what I said. In cells, you have all kinds of different shapes. You have different kinds of topologies or more uh, kinds of shapes, like spherical shapes, where the two curvatures are similar and positive. Cylindrical shapes, when, where one curvature is zero and the other curvature is positive. Saddle-like shapes, where the two curvatures have uh, different signs, etc., etc. Okay? So understanding all these things were, was quite important for, in, in terms of, of biology. So then we came to, the, to square one. So Aurora said, sure, you have all this. You want to do this. You have a phase field. So we can do a phase field. It's fine. You have, instead of surface tension, you put, you put the curvature energy. So as uh, she already presented before, so it's you have a bit more numbers, but at the end, it's basically the same idea. You have a, an interface, which the energy of the interface in the sharp interface limit, instead of being a surface tension, is the health free energy, the bending energy. Okay. So then we started uh, applying this, uh, this phase field to first, as a proof of concept, to try to find what were the stationary shapes of, of uh, closed vesicles. And we actually found that uh, by the phase field, by just changing what's called the redu reduced volume, which is somehow the volume to area ratio of, of, the, of the vesicle, 
then there's different shapes are the ones that take the minimal energy. Okay, so we, f we found those shapes, we compared which, w which uh, was already known from other kind of just uh, solving the differential equations. And from there we were more or less convinced that, yeah, this, this is a reasonable model, it fits with what is known, so let's try to go into more, to try to, to study the dynamic instabilities observed by, by Joel Stavens. So we, we actually saw that you start, I mean, this is already after some time of evolution, we start with a cylindrical tube, we apply a certain concentration of polymer, which means that we change that spontaneous curvature right, that I told you before, which is because this polymer inserts into the membrane and wedges somehow, apply some kind of bending uh, stress into the membrane and it wedges, it creates, it decreases the curvature. So then we could observe that indeed the transition was something like that and there was this kind of onset of the Perlin instability and eventually also with a kind of uh, simulation we could see that there was the, the, the full purling of the, of the whole tube. Okay. So, yeah, Aurora, as you all know, <laughs> she likes very much eating. So when we were also with Mark and Rodrigo, with whom we, we shared the, the, the PhD time, here Rodrigo is a bit older than in the previous picture, and Mark here. Uh, so she always said, yeah, okay, once you publish a nature paper or a science paper, I will take you to El Bulli, which is, was at the time the best restaurant in the world. And yeah, if not, if you have a, a PRL, it's good enough. We can go somewhere good. PRE, well, we go. <laughs> but it was fine. So we went uh, from time to time for lunch. This was a nice place by the university. We didn't manage to get to Al Bulli. <laughs> no, no science paper, but whatever. So yeah, and eventually this was after five years. So we end up uh, with, a, with a thesis that uh, she was, as I said, already many times, my advisor. So it was a very nice time. And after that, so I wanted to, to, try, yeah, to try to continue, continue studying this kind of morphology or how shapes in cells are, are generated or how, how they are important for more biological functions. And I wanted to do also more uh, biology or more experimental work. So for that, I, I, I joined a, a lab in Barcelona of Vivek Malhotra, who's a cell biologist. And then the, the, idea, was, uh, yeah, the idea was to try to study how membrane shaping or membrane curvature generation is important for different biological processes, in particular for what's called a protein secretion or the secretory pathway. So when we all, all of our cells are constantly secreting proteins like insulin, neurotransmitters, collagens, and all these proteins are, when they are synthesized into the cell, they enter the endoplasmic reticulum, and then they are packaged into these small vesicles that Aurora was also uh, referring before, Okay, they go to some intermediate compartment, eventually to the Golgi complex, which is somehow the main sorting station of all these proteins within the secretory pathway. These proteins are then modified, they get glycosylated, which means they get lots of sugars added for their uh, ultimate functions, and eventually at the Trans-Golgi network, or TGN, they are sorted to different destinations. Okay? This is, let's say, the biological process, but it works by a you start with a flat membrane, you bend the membrane, you cut the membrane, then you fuse the membrane, you transport the vesicle, you fuse, etc., etc. So it's really a, a nice uh, biological system to study all these membrane shaping events. So, so yeah, that's the second part. So first it was more from soft matter to and now to, to cell biology. So the first thing I wanted to, to understand is how or what is important for keeping the shape of the Golgi complex, which as you can see in these electron microscopy images, and here is some kind of color code that the different cisterna of the Golgi complex. So these membranes are more or less flat membranes, like what they call like a set of pancakes, okay? And they are polarized, so they have different biochemical identity along the, the different cisterna, okay? But they are very flat and they have a very large rim, which is really highly curved. Okay, which is quite curious if you think from a physical point of view because you say, okay, you have a really large surface area of high curvature. So if you think about curvature energy, this, there must be something that either stabilizes or must keep the flat part or that stabilizes the, the edges of the cisterna. Otherwise, the shape would become something like a stomatocyte or something like a, 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 a ball. Okay. So <clears throat> to cut the, the long story short, so we started yeah. We started doing some experiments and the, the main goal was to try to understand how the, the basic functions of the Golgi complex, which are 
lipid uh, generating and keeping the homeostasis of different lipids, different lipid species, also in the formation of these vesicles, these transport carriers, and also in this glycosylation, what I said, that the proteins are matured, are modified along the Golgi complex, how these proteins were linked together, and if the morphology of the Golgi complex was somehow special or important for, for these proteins to be, uh, for these uh, processes or properties to be maintained. So I will not go into the details, but we found a, a, a nice way to try to mess up with the lipid levels in the Golgi complex and specifically in the Golgi complex, okay? So what we did is we added some kind of short chain, uh, a very small lipid, what's called d ceramide C6. It's not important at this, for, for this talk, but what's important is that what it does is that it's converted into another lipid that we usually don't generate into the cells, okay? So now we are generating some kind of uh, short chain sphingomyelin, another lipid that we don't have, but we measure that once you have this treatment, the biophysical properties of the Golgi membranes are changed. So for instance, we don't have lipid rigid nanodomains, so the lip overall order of the Golgi membranes is affected, and we also saw some kind of more uh, phenotypical uh, effects, like for instance transport or secretion was blocked. So when we mess up with these lipid uh, levels, then there was no proteins entered the endoplasmic reticulum, went to the Golgi, but they, they remained into the Golgi. They were not escaping from the Golgi. So there was a defect in the formation, in the curvature generation at the Golgi complex. And also there was, uh, the proteins went through the Golgi, but they were not correctly modified. They were not glycosylated. Okay? And what for me was the nicest part of it was that up when we had this treatment, these are two kind of control cells, so here, if you can see in these electron microscopy images, the Golgi complex is like what you're used to see in the, in the textbooks, this set of flat cisternae, okay, as here. But when we mess up with this lipid distribution, the Golgi, instead of being a flat set of stack cisterna, turn into some kind of an onion, okay? A different cisterna, you still have a different cisterna, but they were rounded up, okay? So, of course, from my PhD, I said, yeah, this, there's room here for, for modeling or for, for equations, okay? So, that was the question. So, let me put the two things together. So, what I, I was saying before, and the, the goal here was to try to see if we can use these kind of effects we observe to try to, to, to understand what keeps the shape of, of the Golgi cisterna. So, uh, as I said before, if you think only about curvature generation or curvature energy, you have a flat cisterna like this, you have, let's say, this blue part, which is basically flat. It's fine, no energy either. But you have a lot of surface area, which is the rim of the cisterna, highly bent. So one possibility is that there are some proteins, okay, or some lipids, but most likely some proteins that are sitting there, and they stabilize, they generate or stabilize this curvature of the rim. So let's say now you would remove these proteins, then the rim is unstable, and then you can think this more as a, as a line tension, okay? So then there would be some kind of curling into something like this, where you have a very small rim now. Of course, this rim still has a lot of, energy, of bending energy there. And of course, you also increase a bit the energy of this part, but not too much. So if you do the numbers, this, in, in the absence of these guys, this, uh, this, energy is, uh, this shape has a lower bending energy. Okay, this is a possibility. The other possibility, which is, was also based on the experimental observations, was that, okay, you have these rigid nanodomains, I was telling you, when you add this short chain ceramide, this lipid, and we mess up with a lipid distribution, we disrupt somehow this lipid nanodomain. So what could be these guys doing? So one possibility is that they are very rigid, rigid in terms of, of bending rigidity. So it means that if they would be uh, uh, distributed along the whole Golgi, there would be some kind of higher penalty for them to be in the rim, which is highly curved, than from the flat part. So you could, let's say, have some kind of redistribution, okay? But of course, then you have to compare with the uh, entropic part of, of the free energy for a non-homogeneous redistribution. But if you put these guys here, they would decrease the overall bending energy of the membrane, okay? So now changing the balance of these guys could also drive somehow the transition from a flat to a curled cistern, okay? So that, that was the idea that th those were the two possibilities we could think about. So then we tested this as a function of two parameters, one the amount of these nanodomains, and the other one the amount of these proteins that, sta that potentially stabilize the rim of the cisternae. So oops, we did this, so we 
uh, wrote down the, the free the bending energy, the hell free energy with all the terms, with the free energy part for the entropy of, of the nanodomains redistribution. And for instance, for some whatever parameters, a certain area fraction of nanodomains and a certain amount of these guys stabilizing the rims of the cisterna, you have a free energy profile, something like this. Okay? Meaning that in this case, the global minima, minimum of the free energy corresponds to a crawled cisterna, and you still have some kind of metastable state as the, as the flat cisterna. Okay? So this is just for, for one, one, one set of parameters. So of course, we did the, the, the analysis for a wide, uh, a broad range of parameters. And then we could build that some kind of shape diagram as a function of this parameter, which is the amount of stabilizers of the rims, and as a function of the amount of nanodomains. Okay? So as you can see, in orange, uh, means that the, the stable shape is the curl cisterna, so this kind of onion-like shape. Here is the flat cisterna, and in between you have a region like, like the one I showed you before of potential bistability. Okay? So here, the first thing you, you can see is that if you have, so what we observed experimentally was a transition from a flat cisterna, from blue, to a curl cisterna, to orange. So to have such a transition, you, according to this model, of course, this is a model, but you must decrease the amount of these guys. You cannot have a transition from blue to orange just by decreasing the number, the amount of nanodomains, okay? Five, Five meters, perfect. So that was, let's say, the, the main or the first prediction of the model, so that you, you should have some proteins that are stabilizing the rims that when you mess up with a lipid distribution, they should be released from the Golgi. So we tried, we tried different of them, and, oops, sorry. So we found that, for instance, this one, which is it's, uh, some part of clathrin, which is one of these proteins involved in the formation of these vesicles. So clathrin in control cells is here. At the, at this is a Golgi marker, so it's at the Golgi, at the trans-Golgi network, as you can see in these electro, uh, uh, fluorescence microscopy images. Okay, it colocalizes here. But when we mess up the lipid uh, homeostasis, uh, this clathrin was more delocalized. It was, it was not staying at the Golgi. So what, that was a nice somehow validation, experimental validation of, of, the, of the model. So the main idea was to say, okay, so we have um, the cisterna, and the cisterna is stabilized because you have these proteins that are sitting there, and it's proteins like clathrin that they sit there not only to stabilize the shape of the cisterna, but also to bend, to create these vesicles, these transport carriers. So it's somehow a, 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 double, a double effect, right? So if you want to bend the membrane to form a, a transport vesicle, it's better to start from the rim, where you already have some curvature. And while, forming, while, st while stabilizing the rim, you also form the vesicle. So it's some, some kind of, let's say, optimization, if you want, of biological function. So yeah, eventually, so we uh, managed to show that Golgi morphology is important not only as a curiosity, but it's also important to keep the, the different functions of the Golgi. And we also think it's important, I didn't talk about this, but we also think it's important f for protein maturation. And in this case, it's the lipid nanodomains, which we believe they are important to bring the proteins together. So I was very optimistic, so I had a lot more slides that I will, another part that I will really cut. Don't <laughs> worry about this. I, ha I, yeah, I had something on wetting, which was quite cool. But let me just go to the very end. So. This was another, another important, th uh, important problem in biology, in biology, which is how collagens, which are really bulky and, and rigid proteins, how collagens leave ex are exported from the endoplasmic reticulum. Collagens, as far as we know, they can be up to 400 nanometer in, in, in length, and they are quite rigid. But the vesicles, these vesicles that go, that shuttle proteins from the ER to the Golgi, have a size of about 60 to 90 nanometer. Nobody saw anything larger than that. So the question is, how do these collagens go from the ER to the Golgi? So to cut the long story short, so we have an idea which is based on, on a protein called Tango-1, okay? And what we think that Tango-1 is doing is that it's somehow wetting the proteins or binding to the periphery of the proteins that are responsible to curve these membranes to form a transport carrier. And what they do is they act, they reduce the line tension. They act, as we say, as a line actin in analogy to surfactants, okay? So, in the absence of these tango proteins, this guy will close and will close, close prematurely and would not be able to package these long collagens. But what tango one does, sits here into some kind of rings that we also observe experimentally, and basically they keep, they stabilize this neck, and this allows 
with other physical processes, like for instance control of uh, surface tension or maybe force generation, allows for the growth of, of this guy into something longer, a tube, which I would like, I don't know, this is a, let's say a, a hunch, but I think it should be, based on, on the energies, it should be something like a pearl tube. But that's what we are trying to find out experimentally. So yeah, this I will skip, this is the shape, we have some, some stuff, yeah, that's what's the analogy. And before finishing, of course, I would like to thank to, I mean, this is a lot of people involved in, 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 this, in these processes, in, this, in these projects. And, of course, I really want to, to thank and congratulate Aurora. This was also after one of those lunches we had together, somewhere yeah, next to, to the university. This is the hotel. And thank you, congratulations, and thank you all for your attention. Uh, I don't know. Are you in charge? I don't know. Yes. Okay. I'm tired. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Rodolfo Cuerno. I'll, I'll be managing the questions, please. Uh, okay. Is it known if the is it known uh, if the natural function of the Golgi mm -hmm. structure changes or is uh, reduced or actually killed if the shape changes? If the shape. If the shape. Yeah, changes. So there's, that's a good point. There's different things. So let me show you this, for instance, yeah, this thing. So this is the, the standard uh, shape of the Golgi. So this is kept basically through the whole cell cycle, except when the cells go to mitosis for the cell division. So when you have, a, of course, you have a single, what's called the Golgi ribbon, which is a, like the, the connection of the different membranes. When you go for mitosis, this Golgi is completely vesiculated, which is still not understood. No, it's different from that. It's just very small vesicles. So you can uh, split them into the two daughter cells. In such a case where the shape change, not like that, but the shape changes, there's, of course, reduction or almost no transport or no lipid synthesis and no glycosylation. Shapes like this, so this shape is somehow forced. So we, we do something on the cell, which does not naturally happen, and the cell does like that. The thing is that this shape is very similar to another part of another kind of organelle into the cells, which is called the autophagosome. So sometimes cells take flat membranes, still the source of the membrane is not known, and they kind of generate some kind of shape very similar to this, which is involved in degradation or even in some kind of secretion. And we have some molecular machinery which is common in these two processes, in, in whether we observe in the formation of these onions and in this autophagy or autophagosome related. But cells with that structure are able to reproduce? This is a good, we, we wanted to try it, but we couldn't try it. The problem is that, so this ceramide, if you leave it for long enough time, it's toxic to the cells. So if, if you leave for 12 hours, it, they, it has other processes, in, induces apoptosis, cell death. If we leave it for half an hour or up to four hours, and then we wash it out, everything is fine, everything is reversible, okay? But we cannot force the cells to go into mitosis with this shape because the cells would just die for other, other processes. Yeah, but I would expect there would be a, a, at least a delay in, into mitosis because for mitosis you need to vesiculate the Golgi. And this we know that this Golgi cannot be vesiculated. Some more question? I, I have a curiosity about the uh, phase field modeling. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to incorporate like <coughs> rigid structures to the, to the membrane, like cytoskeleton? Yes. In this type of approach? Yeah, so there's, I mean, with a phase field, I, I think you did with, with Guillermo, no? So you, you can couple the, so you have the, the phase field energy of bending the membrane, mm -hmm. and you can couple with the elasticity of a cytoskeleton below. So with this you can also, because for instance, for the shape of the red blood cell is also quite important, the, the okay. cytoskeleton. Uh -huh. mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Full elasticity. Yeah. Some more questions or comments? If not, we thank Thanks. Felix again.
es el coffee break. Ahora hay el, 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 el café. 